All right, so the first thing we need to really think about when it comes to circular motion is just like analyzing what the object is doing that's moving in a circle, okay? A couple of things that are uh, required for something to move in a circle. You've got to have like a, a center point. And then, you know, here's, here's the mass over here. And if it moves in a circle, then it's going to take this, this path that looks like, you know, a circle, which mine kind of looks like an ovally egg looking thing. So there's probably um, something, the distance from the center to the, pa uh, the path, which, what do we call that thing? The radius. And if it's moving, then this this object, this mass right here, will have a, like a velocity. So far, so good? Okay. Now, the velocity, though, is tangent to the path. So something must be acting on our mass to keep it moving. So maybe this is a mass that's being... Um, moved in a circular motion because of a rope or something attached to it. So there maybe there's a rope right there. And if you were to draw a force diagram of all the forces acting on your mass at that point, um, you would have, from looking over the top of it, all I would see is maybe the, the force of tension in that rope pulling it towards the center because the rope would be acting on the mass. Now that force is towards the center, but the velocity is this way. So in the next second, if the object is going up, but it's being forced to the left, where's the object going to be in the next second or the next moment? It's going up, but being forced left, it's going to be like right here. And now its velocity will be pointing this way. And now the force would be towards, still towards the center because my rope will have moved. So now it's kind of going up into the left, but being forced down into the left. So where's our object going to be later? Like right here, it's going to move a little bit more to, yeah. And so the velocity is going to be tangent, but the force is still directed towards the center because that's that's where the rope is. Yep. The velocity for something moving in a circle must be perpendicular to the force because as soon as the force is perpendicular to the velocity, we start changing the direction of the velocity so that it moves not in one dimension anymore, but in two. Okay? So then it's, be, it's moving this way, but being forced that way. So we'll have a um, velocity like right here. Here's our velocity, and here's the force pointing still towards the center. So is there an acceleration? If acceleration is defined as change in velocity over change in time. And velocity is defined as being the magnitude and the direction. Is the velocity changing? Yes. Because the direction is changing. So if the velocity is changing, there is an acceleration. Even if the magnitude of the velocity is the same all the time, which is weird, and you have to be careful. So the speed can remain the same, the speed can be constant while the direction changes.
Therefore, there's still an acceleration. And it's a special kind of acceleration. It's an acceleration that is directed along the path of the force, which is towards the center. So it is a center-seeking acceleration. And so I'm going to put a little C subscript there. So it is the A sub C, which will stand for centripetal. acceleration where the word centripetal means center seeking I'm not actually a huge fan of the word centripetal because I think that um, it causes some misconceptions so if you just if you called it the center seeking acceleration, then I would be just as happy as if you called it the or probably happier than calling it the centripetal acceleration. Okay, so to determine this center seeking acceleration, okay, um, I'm gonna look in a, at a zoomed in picture of an object moving in a circle. Okay, so here's the center, and here's my object, and it has a velocity of v. It's at a distance r from the center, and then I'm going to look at it a second time when its velocity is pointing tangent still to the circle, but it's over here in the second position. It's still r from the center, and it has moved through an equal angle to the vertical. So let's do some, some geometry here. Would this angle here, I'm going to call phi, okay, be equivalent in magnitude to this angle here that is green that I'm going to also call phi? So this angle is the same as that angle. This is perpendicular, so this is a right angle here, and this is a right angle there. So this angle should be equal to that angle, right? Tangent to the circle here, tangent here, these two angles should be equal. Okay? All right, so if that's true, then let's look at our change in velocity over change in time, okay? So if acceleration is change in velocity over change in time, and this, excel this velocity actually has uh, two components. It has an x component. So the initial velocity in the x direction would be v cosine phi. My final velocity in the x direction would be um, v cosine phi. Right? Curl back to the picture there. Okay. And would my initial velocity in the y direction be v sine phi and my final velocity in the y direction be negative v sine phi? Was there a change in velocity in the x direction? No. So there's that means there's no acceleration from this point to that point, no, the average acceleration from the initial point to the final point in the x direction is zero. So is there a change in velocity though in the y direction? Yeah. So you have final minus initial, which will be what? Negative 2v sine phi. So if phi is equal to theta, I'm going to use a highlighter right here. Let's call this little leg of the triangle that I drew L. That should be equal to this little leg of the triangle L. So let's call those L. L <coughs> and L. So then what's the sign of theta?
L over R. So I'll have negative 2V times L over delta T times R. Okay, now what is the time? So, okay, if you're going to move from this point right here to this point right there, and this is the radius, and you've got theta here, and you've got a theta there that are equal, and this is R, this distance right here would be S. Right? Isn't that an arc length? And then S would be equal to R times 2 theta. So, all right, let's make a substitution for time. So if velocity is distance over time, then our change in time will be what distance over velocity. And the distance traveled is this arc length, which is the S is equal to R times 2 theta. So we could write that delta T is equal to R times 2 theta over V. So substitute that back in. We'll have a negative 2V sine theta over R times 2 theta over V. So that's what negative V squared times sine theta over R theta. Now, if If theta is really small, then the sine of theta is approximately equal to theta. And you can check that in radian mode in your calculator. Like if you do the sine of 0.1 radians, what do you get? 0.1. So if the sine of theta is really close to equal, being equal to theta, then the sine of theta over theta would cancel out <clears throat> if theta is really small. So much, much smaller than the picture actually drew. We would get negative v squared over r. Now why is it negative? We go from moving up in the y direction to moving down in the y direction. So if you're going to have something stop moving up and start moving down, like when you throw something into the air, what does it do? It starts by moving up, it stops and comes back down. Which direction is the acceleration? Down. So in the perspective that we're looking at a particle as it goes across this top portion of the circle, we get an acceleration that is directed straight down straight down towards the, starts with a C, ends with an enter, the center. So we could say that the magnitude of the center seeking acceleration at any time is V squared over R, where the direction It's directed towards the center of the circle. So even if you're on the bottom side of the circle, the same equation works. But the direction would be up because the two signs would be flipped. So today what I want to do with our remaining time is look at a particular example of circular motion. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to have a stopper, like a rubber stopper that you would see in uh, chemistry or or something like that and it has, it's going to have a string attached to it 
and that string is going to be threaded through a smooth edged pipe. Okay, and then we're going to hang um, a hanger from here that we can stack masses on. So if you swing this stopper around your little head without bopping yourself in the head in a nearly flat circle. So imagine that's like a perspective drawing and we're looking at the side edge and I'm an awesome artist and you can tell that that is moving in a circle, that it looks like an oval because of our perspective. Yeah, I'm trying to draw 3D on a two-dimensional surface. It's not working so well, right? Okay, anyway, if we swing it around around our head to where the angle is pretty small, so I'm going to make this like theta there, so theta is going to be really small, then we could draw a free body diagram of our stopper. So here's the stopper. It has a tension force on it due to the string, and it would have a weight force on it due to the earth. So far so good? Whoops. Where this angle we'll use the angle to the vertical. So if I were to, and the center is over here. So if I were to sum the forces in the x direction, the x direction being horizontal here, is there any force that's balancing this tension's x component? Nope. So there is an FT, and if that's theta, so opposite sine theta, which is causing it to have an acceleration directed towards the center because the stopper is going to change direction. If I sum the forces in the y direction, and it's not rising or falling, then the tension component adjacent cosine minus the gravitational component should be balanced. Now, if theta is the angle to the vertical and that angle becomes very, very big, so we're looking at almost a flat circle. So I'm going to draw a coordinate system over here. And here's our stopper. And let's say that it's almost a flat circle so that the tension is just barely above the axis, Ft. That would make the angle to the vertical, this theta right here, approximately equal to what? Almost 90? What is the sign of almost 90? Degrees. Yeah. So if the um, path is nearly horizontal, then that means that Ft times the sine of almost 90 would be equal to almost Ft. Does that look right? Because that's almost 1. So we can approximate the tension force or the, the x component of the tension force to be equal to the tension in the cord. So Ft in the would be equal to M A C. Now what would cause the tension in the cord for my system where I got a string and a stopper and the rope goes through the the pipe and I've got masses hanging over here? What's causing the tension in the rope? Yeah, can you sum the forces on the mass on the other end? Uh huh, the gravitational force would be equal to. So if you have your masses, you've got a tension force up on the masses times the gravitational force of the masses hanging on that end. 
So your FT here would be equal to, I'm going to call it capital M times G. So that capital M represents the mass of the stuff that's hanging. And little m represents the mass of the stopper. Because that's the thing that's swinging. A stopper. Oh my goodness. So does that mean that mg would be equal to mac? Okay. Now we derived an equation for ac as being v squared over r. Could you measure the radius? It would be almost the length of the string. Okay, what about velocity? How could you find the velocity of an object that's moving around in a circle? Uh-huh, the velocity is distance over time, and you said circumference, so 2 pi r over the time to go around one time, which has a special name. period. So the time for one cycle. Okay. So mm, looks like capital M, the hanging mass, times G would be equal to the mass of the stopper times V squared over R. And our V is 2 pi R over period. So we'd have to Capital M is equal to M of the stopper times 2 pi R over period all squared over R. That looks ugly, right? So let's see, MG would be equal to M stopper times, what, 4 pi squared R R squared, but then divided by R, right? Then over period squared? Okay. Could you rearrange for the mass of the stopper? So the mass of the stopper would be the mass, the hanging mass, times G. Not M, but times G times the period squared, right? Over 4 pi squared r. So you could find the mass of the stopper if you did one trial. Is that um, what, you know, time the period and measure the, the radius? You, you would have the capital M, that would be the mass of the stuff hanging. Gravitational field constant is a constant. You could time the period. 4 pi squared is a constant, and R is something you could measure. Right? Well, if we take multiple data. So let's go back to the version that looked like mg is equal to mass of the stopper times 4 pi pi squared r over period squared. Now let's think about this in terms of y is equal to slope times x plus intercept. If you varied something and then measured something else, so maybe we could change the hanging mass. That would be changing this guy. And then we could measure what the period is every time. Right? Okay. So in this case, could I have a graph of mass times G? And then wouldn't the mass of the stopper, 4 pi r, 4 pi squared times r, wouldn't those all be constants? Yeah, and then, but period would be a variable. So could I put 1 over the period squared on the x-axis? And then the slope of the line should be mass of the stopper 
times 4 pi squared r should be the slope. 